working on. Um, well, hello everyone. Welcome to part six of the career series. Um, I feel like I've been doing these for ages. And when I started doing these, it was actually light outside and now it's pitch dark. Um, but welcome everyone and welcome especially to Shabana Mahmood. We are ecstatic to have you. Um, when I started planning this career series months and months ago, I emailed so many people and you were definitely one person I thought was, was never going to have time to respond to me. So I am beyond grateful that you're here. And um, before we get kick off, kick off on questions or anything like that. I'm just going to introduce the career series. Um, so for anyone who hasn't been here before, we are the Women in Law Society at the University of Birmingham. We aim to increase the female population in the legal workforce and the political workforce and the careers in general everywhere. We hope that through our initiatives and our campaigns and our events that we can increase the confidence of women in the skills that they already do have and the skills that they don't yet have but will be able to have to enter the legal force or whatever force they want to enter into. We are the Women in Law Society but we aim our skills are transferable through all of the degrees and the university in general. We hope that equality will not only be a fiction but in practice and in every workforce and we also appreciate that men can also suffer from confidence issues and selling themselves but we are mainly here to know that women in the legal workforce especially in senior positions is a gendered issue and we hope to combat that and inspire all of the university students to aspire to any career that they want to have and this career series wasn't but in well I designed it because I realized that because we got so many talks on commercial law careers we never got anything on people who wanted to be charity lawyers people who wanted to be MPs and anybody who wanted to divert from the usual um, commercial law profession that we got so many talks on so that's why I invented this career series and I hope through which we can inspire people to combat and go on the career journeys they would love to go on and to get a real feel from behind the scenes because we always get talks on applications but never about careers and lives and journeys towards the careers that people aspire to be so that's why I created this career series and this is the part I'm most excited about because we always have these law talks but we've never had a talk about from the journey to law to um to a politician because I think it's actually quite common which is why I designed this um and I had an interest for it so this is my part six and I'm so excited to introduce finally now I've done my ramble um Shabal Mahmood MP if you would love to introduce yourself just who you are and what you do now just a little bit before I then take you way back to your interest in law and start you back from there uh, great, thank you so much for having me uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Shabana Mahmood. I'm the Member of Parliament for Birmingham Ladywood constituency. Um, I was first elected in 2010 and re-elected at the most recent general election, which uh, was almost exactly a year ago, actually, scarily enough. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm a, I've been in this job just over 10 years now. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Oh, right. We are going to take you right back to your legal interests and law journey for all of those who have attended. I know that there are some people who do politics degrees and law degrees. This will be really interesting. Um, so my first question is, where did your interest in law begin? Was it before your degree? And tell us a little bit about your degree as well. Um, so... I think I wanted to be a barrister probably before I fully understood what being a barrister was and I have a vague memory of um, uh, one of the elders in my family saying oh Shabana really likes to talk and argue she'd be a really really good lawyer um, and then I think it was my dad who said oh she should be one of those that goes to court with the wig and the gown and I think that's a barrister and so in my head I thought oh that's what I'll do because everyone you know seemed to be saying I should. Um, I got serious about it when um, I don't know if other, I always feel really old uh, talking about Kavanaugh QC because it was such a thing when I was growing up but like every young person I've spoken to has obviously never heard of this program so when I talk about my life journey they all think it's a bit weird but uh, Kavanaugh QC I wanted to be him even though he was a white man uh, but I grew up watching that program and I thought right that's that that's the job for me um, and so it was always kind of in my head for those two reasons really I didn't I didn't really give it that much more thought until I came to doing work experience when I was at secondary school um, I think I must have been about 40 um, and uh, I got work experience actually at a solicitor's firm which my school helped arrange for me but I ended up essentially shadowing the barrister on the case that the solicitor was working on that week which happened to be going to trial and it was like 
so exciting and I watched these people doing this job and I thought this is definitely definitely the career for me um, and then from then I basically made a very quick decision I was going to study law at university and I had this belief in my head that um, it was really difficult for people like me to become barristers and I, I, I essentially I had to go to Oxford and you know I had to get a you know a scholarship and all those kind of things so I put quite a lot of pressure on myself but that's because um, everybody I spoke to um, didn't look like me and um, a lot of people who did then encourage me also told me to be very realistic about the challenges uh, that, that I would have so um, uh, I kind of set my goals high but I was lucky enough to win a place at Oxford to study law and that's that's what I went on to do and I had three of the best years of my life doing it. That's that's absolutely brilliant. Um, what so what was your experience um like at Oxford studying law in terms of the actual degree itself um, and then the act extracurricular activities you got involved with because I know that there's quite there's quite a lot of opportunities but I don't know what your experience was. Yeah, uh, I mean I I really loved the study of the law um and uh you know there wasn't there wasn't any part of my degree that I did not enjoy I had a vague phase where I didn't really like contract law very much but then I kind of got my head around it and and started to enjoy it much more but you know um public law administration constitutional law uh we studied jurisprudence as a sort of standalone topic which I absolutely adored you know just getting my head around the philosophy behind the law the different ways of interpreting the law feminist uh, jurisprudence um all that kind of stuff it just really interested me partly because it was I guess it spoke to my other interest which was always politics as well and and society more generally um, and so much of it is obviously the the organization of society and the rules by which society is organized and who makes those decisions and so just every part of it I always really really enjoyed um, the main uh, the main sort of activities I got involved in my second year I was elected as um, uh, the JCR president at my college so obviously for those who don't know uh, Oxford split into sort of 40 odd different colleges and each college essentially has its own student union which is called the junior common room or JCR and every year they had their sort of elections for their officers and um, at the end of my first year I stood for election and won uh, so I was the JCR president during my second year um, and I found that quite challenging because I had to sort of do my do my duties as the JCR president and and keep on top of my studies um, which meant I had many more essay crises than I probably care to admit to usually uh, in a wider <laughs> audience. Um, funnily enough for somebody who's very political and has been political from a young age and grew up in a very political family I avoided p political societies at university like the plague mostly because everybody I met like talked as if they thought they were going to be the prime minister and I found that really quite off-putting and um, it just didn't I, I, maybe it was a confidence thing I'm not sure I just didn't think I'd fit in or belong so I avoided um, you know I didn't get involved with the university student union because that was quite party political didn't get involved with sort of labor clubs or anything like that either kind of kept my political activism as a very much uh, Birmingham thing so you know during vacations and you know I was still knocking on doors and campaigning for other candidates and MPs and councillors in Birmingham uh, but at university I sort of kept, kept myself focused just on essentially being a good JSR president and giving voice to the student body and 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 then my studies as well so um I, I mean I took part in other smaller college societies as well but my biggest activity was obviously doing the student union stuff yeah, I think that's brilliant. We don't really, I mean, have student, we have the Guild of Students, so you can apply to be a women's officer or yeah. um, sports officer and things like that. So we kind of do have something similar to that. How valuable do you think that was that role? Because that's that's a really amazing role, actually. How valuable do you think that was in terms of the skill set that you've developed from that? Um, I think I, I think putting myself up for election in a place where I still, if I was completely honest with myself, felt a bit out of place and a bit uncomfortable uh, was just a good confidence builder. So, you know, you put your head above the parapet when you, you put yourself forward for an election, uh, especially amongst a student body. I mean, it was much harder running for JCR president than running for an actual election to the actual House of Commons because <laughs> dealing with the you know the broader public I just have always found easier than um you know and may, and maybe that's because I, I I didn't necessarily have a lot of innate confidence when I was myself an 18 and 19 year old um uh, young person uh but you know when I walked into Lincoln College Oxford my first night I was the only person that looked like me and that's not an unusual thing uh for me but um you know uh, most of my secondary school experience or all of my secondary school experience was at a school where um you know 90 percent of the student body was from a similar background to myself you know in the city birmingham asian 
probably from a Muslim household. Uh, I went to a different school to do my A-levels, which was much more mixed, you know, um, uh, one of Birmingham's grammar schools, um, King Edward's Camp Hill, which is where I did my A-levels. So, I mean, I, I'd had a bit of more of an experience, but that was still quite a diverse, you know, because it reflects Birmingham and I know it's selective, but it's plenty of ethnic minority kids at that school. Um, so mm -hmm. walking into university, that was my first actual proper hardcore experience of I'm the only one of my kind and I was meeting students for whom I was the first non-white face they had ever seen in real life as well um, and so I think that I, the, the thing I took most from then having just pushed myself to run for, for sort of being their president after a year of being there was just the value I took from it was I put myself forward and I had the confidence to do that and eventually I told myself that I, I didn't care if I won or not because the experience in itself was a good thing and I was demonstrating to all of these people that I had the confidence to assume I could basically win an election and, and be in charge <laughs> which I thought was you know for, for personal growth was quite important obviously I didn't really expect to win which is exactly what happened in my political career as well I didn't really expect actually to win the selection that got me um, uh, chosen as the Labour candidate in Ladywood but um, having committed to it, I then did it properly. And that's that's something I took, you know, further on when I was both a lawyer and then also um, as a politician. Once I made a decision and I put my head above the parapet, then I was 100 percent on it, even if inside I thought, well, I'm not going to win, but it's a good life experience. <laughs> and <laughs> all these people will probably respect me a bit more and pay a bit more attention to what I have to say. So I think that's that's probably what I took most from it. Um, but obviously, once I won, you know, I got a lot of confidence from that. Um, and I learned all the different levels of advocacy in a very kind of basic way, but, you know, lobbying for our rents to not go up, um, lobbying for, you know, repairs in, in students' bedrooms. You know, it's not that different to some of the lobbying I do now, which is, you know, hassling Birmingham City Council to do repairs on their properties that my constituents live in. So um, I, I, I sort of developed that kind of more general advocacy skill as well I think when I was doing that that role which which definitely helped in both of the things I went on to do uh, once I graduated. Yeah I think I think that's absolutely brilliant as well because obviously we we have mooding as well but there's so many other ways that you can definitely build up those sort of adversarial skills and uh, uh, that could be transferable into so many different professions I completely agree and um, just while we're on the topic of university before we move on to um, your extensive career and um, do you have any tips for anybody starting off trying to because we have quite a lot of diverse people from first year to um, second year or wherever do you have any tips for anybody who has imposter syndrome who wants to start applying for for these positions who wants to go for maybe a, a women in law position a society position or or any vacation scheme application in general do you have any tips for anybody um i i i think the the sort of biggest takeaway from my own life experience is um if, if you don't put in or you don't put yourself forward then you'll never you'll never progress and you'll never know if that was a good thing for you or not um and so the trick i learned was not to see losing something as a defeat so i i was all, already thinking for example when i ran for jcl president you know this will be a great story to tell at an interview in the future or this will be a you know this will be something that i'll be able to refer back to later on in my life um and 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 definitely seeing the process of running or putting yourself forward as an end in itself I think is quite quite important because um, then you stop focusing on whether you're going to get the win at the end of it and so it doesn't knock your confidence quite as much if you think part of the win is I put myself forward um, and and also to not second guess yourself or feel or, or almost prior shame and guilt and humiliation for losing at something um, before before that's happened you know and and to to, to just go for it really I, th I think that um if i if i was back at university i'd probably try my hand at more things than i than i did um i, I think i was already sort of you know just trying to fit in and get on with things and very much focused on my studies and you know wanting to do really well um i i kind of almost contracted I, even though I went on obviously to do this really great thing uh, during my second year I kind of contracted myself quite quickly as well um, and I think lots of women and girls end up doing that your world contracts quite a lot I think there's some studies which show that as soon as young girls hit puberty their world really does contract because they stop taking part in sport and you know they're very much more in their bedrooms and that was definitely my experience so um, uh, you know if I could go back and say to 18 year old Shabana uh, when she's off to university I'd say 
don't let your world contract like this is the time for it to expand because it will definitely contract later when you've got bills to pay and and you know <laughs> bosses to please and all sorts of things to do like you know your, your world will contract because of life um so actually university is probably the last shot you have at you know sort of expansion um of your life experiences and so i would definitely go back and put myself forward for even more stuff um and uh see each of those you know, acts of putting myself forward or applying for things or taking part in things as the win, uh, rather than whether ultimately there was a notion of success at the end of it or not. Mm -hmm, definitely. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, there's so many brilliant questions here, so I'm going to try and lead us into the legal path. Um, so we have one question here, which is brilliant. It says, hi, Shabana, in building a career in public policy as a lawyer, how do you navigate this? Where do you start from? I'm a first year LLB from grad student and I've been searching for some vacation placements or internships in public slash administrative um, law, but most available opportunities are largely in commercial law firms. Do you have any tips for them? Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I guess, I guess, um, I mean, my, my kind of political career is in a way it's sort of separate from my legal career. So my legal career didn't really impact or impinge on issues of public, public policy. So I was a specialist in professional indemnity litigation, um, and I was doing a lot of prof neg claims, um, solicitors and local authorities, mostly, um, acting almost exclusively for defendants and their insurance companies. So I had quite a, it, it, it's, it's a different um, sort of field when you're doing public policy and sort of the legal aspects of public policy than the, the, the area of law that I was uh, specialising in. Uh, but I, I mean, I think you're right, that there are fewer opportunities um, I would say that if you're looking, if you're looking at um, spaces in which you can learn about that kind of intersection of law and public policy, um, I'd, I'd, I'd go beyond sort of the the kind of traditional spaces. I, I mean, there's a lot, sit, I and mean, there's fewer of these things around. But you know, I, I'd say refugee and migrant centre. You, you'll see a lot more about human rights law in a place like that uh, than you would in in, in most of the places. Um, uh, citizens advice. You know, you'll you'll learn a lot about that kind of intersection of not just what, say, for example, a piece of benefits regulation says, but the actual real life impact that it has whether it was intended by parliament or not um, and and what are the different ways that it might be challenged so uh, you know for example on monday i was raising questions about the way in which a quirk of housing benefit works where um, housing providers currently are creaming off extra enhanced payments for vulnerable um, residents who need support they don't really provide the support the regulations kind of assume that the only people that would enter into this housing market would be already providing support so there's a gap um government sort of hiding behind uh we we kind of think that this is you know for the housing department to sort out not benefits and i'm saying it's for both to sort out but but really i picked that up from my advice surgery and the only other place you'd see a case like that would be somewhere like citizens advice bureau um but it raises really important issues of um you know the use of judicial discretion how campaigns are fought and won whether things always require legislative change I think I'm probably not going to get any legislative change on the, this particular topic. So I'm looking more at getting the government to issue guidance. So, you know, you, you, you'll, you'll pick up if you, this is the sort of world you're interested in, you'll pick up those kinds of things a lot more in the third sector space. Um, housing charities are a really great way also to pick up a lot about public, public policy and public law. So if you're finding opportunities not available in sort of more traditional spaces, th those are the other kind of areas I'd look at. Yeah, I think I think that's brilliant advice. I, yeah, I think that's so good. Thank you. Um, and on, on that then, so from your law degree, how was your experience for pupillage? What was it like? Um, and where did you end up? What was the, the beginnings of your legal career? Um, so uh, I, I'm conscious that sort of my experience might be quite out of date. So uh, forgive me for this isn't how it works anymore. But when I so when I finished, um, uh, for uh, I went to what was then the Inns of Court School of Law, but which is now um, uh, oh God, what's it aligned to now? Another university. I've forgotten the name. See, I'm very out to date. But it was then the Inns of Court <laughs> School of Law, which is where I went to do my uh, what was then called the Bar Vocational Course. I'm not sure if it's still called the BVC anymore. Um, and uh, at that time, you had two seasons of application. So if you didn't want to take, if you didn't want to be forced to take a year out after finishing the Bar Vocational Course, you had two seasons worth of applications. The summer in the autumn season and um, if you didn't make it then then essentially you had to take a year out and apply for, for, for the following
following year in essentially so I um I totally messed up my summer season applications I applied to all the wrong sets I don't even know why I look back and I think what an idiot because I applied to sets that I thought were like the best <laughs> so silly um mm. I've stopped quite a lot of young people making the same mistake as me by the way uh, but you know I I sort of applied for sets without looking at the CVs of all the barristers that they had taken on as juniors and all these people had masters and PhDs and were like practically professors before they became tenants and I'm I'm applying just with my you know standard um you know BA in law <laughs> so um I I mean I did get some interviews and had a couple of absolute horrors as well <laughs> um, so I very much treated my first season of applications as like a, a practice run but then I really felt the pressure of the autumn season applications because um, you know I thought I don't want to take a year out I wouldn't have known what to do with myself really I'm, I mean obviously I'm sure I would have uh, you know made the best of it if it had happened but I, I put a lot of pressure on myself and um, uh, the second time round I made more um, sensible choices I thought more carefully about the sort of law I would probably end up doing um, I, I properly investigated the CVs of all the lawyers that were being taken on at these places to make sure that they weren't all practically professors uh, before before mm -hmm. getting um, uh, taken on um, I had more interviews that time round. I dealt with my interviews better as well uh, I was better with all the exercises that they made us do, you know, um, doing, you know, various mock applications, that kind of thing. So second time round, I had a lot more confidence. Um, and then I, I got a, a pupillage offer from the, the set I really wanted. So I was really lucky because um, I got a pupillage from 12 Kings Bench Walk um, who did sort of general civil litigation. And they were the nicest people as well in, all, in that cohort uh, of second time round interviews that I had. They were by far and away the people that felt um, more like I could get along with in a place that I could fit in so um, I, I was delighted and I you know as a, as a concern of all young young people certainly when I was applying it was properly paid so you were you know paid £10,000 for your first six and guaranteed £10,000 worth of earnings for your second uh, which obviously gave me a baseline to live off and work from as well so that was that was a very welcome <laughs> break that I got <laughs> uh, at that point but I, I did have some absolute shockers first time round so um, you know, I, I definitely learned a lot of lessons mostly how not to do mock applications in front of silks which uh, was uh, <laughs> was quite the experience so yeah, then I, I, I yeah sorry gone no no go ahead I just no, said, I, yeah, was, no, I, I can imagine <laughs> yeah uh, I went on to obviously my pupillage there um uh had a I think I think um I had a a mixed year um I I, I still find it quite difficult you know being again I'm still very different from pretty much everybody in that set so I was still essentially the only person from my kind of background um and and I don't just mean sort of race or religion but but also life experience you know no, nobody else in that set was they were very nice most of them but nobody else was from you know an inner city <laughs> part of a uh, part of uh, uh, a place like mine so you know, my kind of class experience was very very different I remember the first um the sort of first week there I went to do the sort of tea run for everybody I went to the kitchen to make tea and there's about 25 different kinds of tea and I was thinking where the hell is the PG tips um because you know but they all had you know their various quite posh teas and I'd never seen these that, that variety before in my life and <laughs> I just thought god it's a different world really <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Um, well, one question we have which is related to this aspect is um, from Lynette. It, she says, hi Shabana, um, I was wondering if you had any advice on how best to sell yourself and your experience and skills during applications and interviews and I think that's then quite applicable to people who want to apply for the bar it is I think it's a very similar process I'm not one for the bar myself but it is basically the same thing where you do have the pupillage and then applications yeah. for tenancy and things like that so do you have any tips on how best to sell yourself uh, and your skills yeah I mean definitely don't sell yourself short um uh definitely sort of you try try in advance to have got as many good experiences so I had done um, a few mini pupillages um, in Birmingham um, obviously I, I had I'd, I'd been building up 
quite a bit of work experience ever since I did my first when I was 14, which was, you know, sort of mandated through school. Uh, but after that, I'd been picking up odds and sods of work. Um, we, the, the Commission for Racial Equality, as it then was, had an office in Birmingham and I managed to get a temping gig in there. But then I sort of stayed on essentially in a sort of weird volunteer intern capacity. But, you know, I was I was doing that. And they, they were sort of starting their first kind of uh, claims under what was then the new human rights act and so I, I kind of got a bit involved in that so all, all the way through I had been building up work experience which I think uh, definitely when I got into 12 things French walk you know that was that was one of the factors that had helped my CV stand out from the crowd a bit obviously uh, the sort of general advocacy at university that I'd done through being JCR president and sort of projects I'd worked on uh, the things I was able to um, show and demonstrate that I had advocacy ability that I could take a lot of arguments and marshal them very quickly and work out what I was going to say about them so every kind of bit of experience that I had that spoke to that was what I then amplified um, when when I was writing my applications um, and so I, I, I would say you definitely have to have a game plan if you're going to do this you commit to it and then you know you've got to spend a bit of time building all of those things up but once you've once you've done it then then I think you you are able to demonstrate certainly you should be able to get through that first sift of CVs but in interview you'll be able to demonstrate that you have the sort of skills they're looking for um, and, mm -hmm. and for me the two of advocacy and um, you know synthesizing a lot of information very quickly and thinking on your feet what to say about it um, that that I think is quite important I didn't really do yeah. moots and things like that so much actually I, I don't know why but I, I didn't um, I, I did other things that involve speech making and thinking on my feet but but not so much mooting but I know that that's something obviously that a lot of people do and certainly most of most of the people I was competing with um, when we were all applying you know had prizes and you know in in, in all these kinds of area so it's it's definitely something I think if, if you're going to do it that should be part of your game plan yeah yeah definitely thank you for that advice I think that'd be really useful um, and then in terms of life at the bug up bar beginning life at the bar like the kind of work you did what was it like for you your experiences of being different I know that it's the, the bar is finally changing a little bit we are nowhere near where we should be in terms of diversity opportunities beginning in the bar and progression in the bar what was it like for you starting out in terms of work um, and being from a different background to the majority of people um, so, so my pupillage, um, I, I, I had a really brilliant first, um, so I had three pupil masters, um, we switched every four months, my first eight months were great, um, and I really got on very well with my pupil masters, and you know, it was, it, it was, it was a very, I thought I was doing really well, <laughs> and then I had a terrible um, a final, final bit, um, I did not gel uh, either with my pupil master or the uh, barrister that he shared his office with, um, I just thought I just had a horrible time of it uh, in the, in the last phase. It really knocked my confidence like very very significantly. And I went from thinking, you know, I was writing re what I thought were and what my first pupil master would also say that like, you know he'd compare his counter schedule on a claim with my counter schedule, and you know there was hardly any difference. And he was, you know, I, I knew he was impressed, and I felt quite proud of myself. So I thought I'm doing a good job here, and I wrote very quite harsh counter schedules if I'm honest. But you know. Uh, if you're acting for the defendant, that's sort of the, the, the job you have uh, in the sorts of claims work that I was doing. But then I got to the end and I just I just had a terrible time of it. And I, I, I overheard one of the, this was a terrible moment. I overheard the senior clerk basically slagging me off and saying he wasn't gonna mm -hmm. put me forward. He then lost his job a few years later because um, they found out he was a, a very bad person. Um, I won't go into what happened, but you know, I, I was sort of at the receiving end of his um, vitriol. Um, and, you you know unwarranted uncalled for um he just sort of took against me but I wasn't getting the same kind of work in my second six that my the other two young women who were pupils at the same time I was were so I could tell that they were being favored and given given more opportunities and that definitely knocked my confidence a lot and then just those that you know my last pupil master was really not that that supportive um mm -hmm. seemed to think it was something wrong with me um but but then not telling me the sort of test that I needed to meet in order to kind of improve the the impression that people had so for you know unsurprisingly I didn't get a tendency um and I mean I was relieved I was crushed for what I in terms of you know I felt like a failure but I was relieved not to have to spend any more time in a place where I really had 
grown to feel quite depressed, frankly. Um, I then, but, but uh, you know, my very first pupil master uh, and my second pupil, I mean, they basically were devastated for me, um, thought the chambers were making a big mistake. And um, they, they wrote p very personal references to people they knew to help me get a third six and get a tenancy somewhere else, which I, you know, even in the midst of all that sort of horrible experience, I've always like, got enough you know nothing but good things to say mm -hmm. about those people who really stuck up for me um but actually in the end um I got an offer from uh, Berryman's Lace Moore who um had sort of in the last few years just before I applied uh, been taking on uh, barristers as employed barristers so you get to retain your barrister status and they had a couple of silks at the firm who would then become your supervisors for that first period of post-grad um, sorry post um, qualification experience so I, I decided to make the leap and jump over there um, because I, d I couldn't face the idea of doing a third six and doing yet more road traffic accident claims uh, on a fast track <laughs> basis at Yeovil County court which is what the last month of my uh, pupillage had all been about and I just thought I don't really want to do that and moving to Berryman's um, meant I could jump straight onto much more um, high value complex litigation and claims uh, much more quickly in my career and if it meant not sacrificing my status as a barrister as well I felt I could have the best of both worlds so that's what I went on to do and that's where I stayed until I made the switch into politics um, and, and I had a great time at Berryman so I, I learned a lot and I did a lot of very interesting cases basically straight away at the very start of my career. Thank you so much for sharing that with us that's not, you don't this is what you don't hear very often is um, obviously you then went on to do a brilliant work as a barrister but you don't I think it's quite inspiring to hear stories like that because it's not all a straight easy path is we're all um, told when we're in law school and when we're being advertised these amazing diverse placements and scholarships and sometimes it's not quite like that obviously it's changing a slight bit but thank you so much for sharing that with us and um, and then that probably leads us very nicely into your journey to being an MP so I, I don't actually I have to say I don't actually know the process myself I would love and I think everybody's really interested into hearing how you then made that switch from being a barrister to um, a really successful MP. Um, so uh, I, I said a bit earlier, political activism has always been a part of my life. Um, as, you know, my dad uh, was chair of Birmingham Labour Party. Uh, lots of people in my family have been campaigning for the Labour Party for as long as I can remember. And, for, you know, it was quite normal from a young age for us to be out delivering leaflets um, for Labour candidates in our ward and in our constituency and across the city. And, you know, I've been door knocking as well for as long as I can remember um so but I guess in a way it, my my political activism is very much Birmingham focused and then my career was very much sort of Oxford and then London so you know I was working at the London office of Berman's uh, when I when I qualified uh, obviously I did my pupillage in London as well and um I don't really know how the two things ended up being like really quite separate parts of my existence. I didn't really plan it that way, but it sort of worked out that way. <laughs> um, uh, but they were they were very distinct parts of, of, of me. I never thought I'd have a career in politics. It's not, um, I, I, I do remember it, a vet, you know, in my sort of late teens at various political meetings, people would say, oh, you know, have you ever thought about being an MP? And I would just think, no, I want to be a barrister. <laughs> I, mean, I had no I had no kind of vision of seeing myself as a member of parliament um and I, I I hadn't I hadn't given it any serious thought every every political party has their own sort of system uh, for um deciding its candidates in the Labour Party obviously you have to be a member of the party um uh, you have to be a member of a trade union as well if you want to be a member of parliament uh, for the party um, and you you essentially just put yourself forward uh, for for a mini election where all of the Labour Party members that live in the constituency that you want to stand in basically have a vote um, and so there's a process it usually lasts um, well I mean it's supposed to last about two months but it can last a bit longer where um, you know candidates uh, you, you have a long listing process candidates are invited to uh, interview then you have short listing and then the shortlisted candidates go forward to a hustings in front of the Labour Party membership in that area and then they have a straight off vote um, and that's how the candidates are chosen um, 
Uh, so, you know, I mean, you, ha you have a process of having your political CV as well, um, but, you know, you normally have to demonstrate, obviously, unsurprisingly to the party membership that you have a good track record in the party, that you haven't just come along because you decided one day you wanted to be an MP and the Labour Party is a useful vehicle. So you do need to be able to demonstrate commitment to the party, activism for the party. Um, but But beyond that, there isn't any other sort of specific you know, ask that is is made. You you just have to put yourself forward. Um, I um so I had been uh, I was sort of two and a half, almost three years into my legal career, and I was coming to a point where, essentially, all of my professional life was in London, and then my personal life was all in Birmingham. So I felt like I lived on the Virgin train service between London and Birmingham, and in fact, Euston and New Street were my real home because I was always up and down on the train. And I was getting to a point where I thought, you know, I probably need to make a commitment here I'm either going to remain a lawyer in London or I'm going to have to switch to finding somewhere to work in Birmingham and switch my legal career here because I, I couldn't face the split between the two cities anymore um so I was kind of coming up to that and I decided to take a career break as well for for that reason to sort of make a life decision and change course but also for for other family reasons so I was taking a short career break uh, and Berryman had been fantastically understanding and were you know very 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 much wanting to facilitate me wherever I wanted to live so they were they were great so I sort of had the comfort of knowing that I wasn't going to be out of work essentially and I could I could take some some time off um, and as that happened the Labour Party because Claire Short had well she'd resigned the Labour whip so she wasn't a Labour MP anymore anyway but she'd also said she was going to retire so the Labour Party in Ladywood constituency was looking uh, to select its Labour candidate to replace Claire Short and I guess you know it was a question of everything aligning I was at home in Birmingham and if there was a selection for a Labour candidate in my own home turf where you know I was born and brought up which is quite a rare thing in politics um, you, those opportunities don't often come along um, I completely dismissed it to begin with because I was 26 years old and I thought if I turned up at my own doorstep and said vote for me I'd laugh and say you're too young go away and come back in 10 years time yeah. um, so I, I sort of dismissed it and then a few other people including my dad and my mum and various other Labour Party people said you should really think about it representing your home turf and politics hardly ever happens you know it's rare you, this all happened this way it's your fate uh, which is what my dad said like, you know um, you it's such a coincidence that this has fallen this way and I thought right okay why don't I just give it a shot and I honestly did the same thing again I thought I'm going to commit to this 100% and I'm going to go all out to win it but I don't expect to win I really did not expect to win um, and I thought it was going to be a fantastic story to tell if I had to do a job interview <laughs> in the following year please explain this gap of about a year on your CV well that was the year I went off to try and become a Labour candidate and failed I thought it would make me a more interesting candidate and honestly that's how I sold it to myself in my head um but I do have this tendency when I've said I'm going to do something I don't leave any stone unturned so I I I did definitely go for it 100% I committed myself to it properly you know I did a full sort of you know consultation with all the members I knew about drawing up my local manifesto um, I had such a degree of familiarity with the Labour Party membership list that I knew people's phone numbers off, off by heart I knew the names of their grandchildren I knew where they were going to school I knew if they had any diseases and like I knew everything about all of those Labour Party members whether they were voting for me or not I could run the numbers in my head all the time how many people I thought were voting for me how many were voting for my main competitor who was the hot favourite um, you know I was running that campaign full on 100% and in the end I won by 19 votes which was how wow, I came to be a member of parliament <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant 19 votes is still 19 votes that's yeah. amazing <laughs> that, kind of, um, that kind of ties into what I hope this answers mostly there's already a question here about how you become an MP I think you've mostly answered it and um, it's just, just it, the question is oh hi I've just joined the Labour Party um, yeah. just wondering in practical terms how you become an MP and um, how you how do we select it as a, a candidate and um, do you have a sandwich constituency and I think the only bit we haven't answered is how to fund campaigning and how to find the right people to help you campaign so I am um... 
uh for, there's there's no funding assistance or support uh generally speaking for candidates who are seeking selection once you get elect uh, selected as the candidate and you're running for an election um then then you are able to draw on more help so uh, when i was a labor candidate uh, well actually i had to do my own fundraising dinner because everyone lady was was classed as a safe seat and going into the 20 gen general election with gordon brown's you know sort of having not called the election in 2008 and the global financial crisis party resources were scarce and I was not in line to have anything spent on me but I did my own fundraising dinner and that's how I raised money for the, for my campaign for my selection campaign I just funded that myself and most candidates I mean that is one of the bars to um, selection that you know the Labour Party is often grappling with like how do we broaden the field of candidates that we have and the diversity of backgrounds when actually you know um, running for selection has a cost in itself so you know i had enough savings that I, I i didn't need to work immediately so i could focus 100 on my campaign i prepared my own literature which i paid for the printing of um you know i wrote to party members so i had to pay for the postage of those letters um there are now more programs to help candidates from uh, less traditional backgrounds enter politics so there's the labor party has a really good uh, program um, focused on female candidates um there's now more assistance as well for uh, black and Asian and ethnic minority candidates as well, which is designed to create a pipeline of talent that can then run for selection. So since I did it, th there's been a, a real change and there is much more help available now than there used to be. Um, but, but back when I did it, it was unfortunately self-funded. So that was immediately disparring to people who, who did not have the means to, to, to do it. The cost was not, in the case of my selection, um, particularly high, um, but some selections, it's not that unusual for candidates to kind of line up for a seat years in advance of a, of a general election being called where they think an MP might be re nearing retirement age. It's not unusual to see candidates getting on you know getting in getting in there and getting on the ground and starting work in preparation quite early which is why the party then has now obviously got its program for, for, for candidates to help people more um and actually sometimes in lots of party memberships being very obviously they're trying to take advantage of a, of a retirement can sometimes now count against you as well <laughs> so members are yeah. you know quite discerning uh, i think um when, when when they know somebody wants to be their mp as well so it's it's a balancing mm -hmm. act you're, you're, you're trying to win election at the end of the day so it's a people business and you've got to convince people at the end of the day yeah definitely definitely and i think i think people are really really interested in to know like what what did you get up to what was your day-to-day -day sort of tasks what what is that different i'm sure it's obviously built on now like what what kind of activities do you do now how do you help the community how do you get involved what kind what kind of day-to-day -day, um responsibilities and tasks do you do you do so um i mean there's probably no two days that are the same <laughs> um and there's a big distinction between uh, the week in parliament the parliamentary part of the week and then the constituency bit of the week so um uh, funnily enough having having decided i needed to make some big life decisions because i was fed up of living between the two cities and always being on the train back and forth from birmingham london that is now actually exactly what my life is still like <laughs> because i'm constantly on the train down to parliament and then back home to birmingham again i never stay in london longer than i need to i'm very much there just for parliament you know i and then i'm back a, 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 as soon as i can be um so the parliamentary week um has a particular pattern and a rhythm to it so uh, mondays through to thursdays monday's always a 2 30 start because you know they they've constructed things so mps can travel on the monday from their constituencies um if they need to um so the the week starts later um and then tuesdays and wednesdays it's a sort of 11 30 start in in the chamber uh, and then you finish at seven mondays is a 10 o'clock at night finish if we have late nights they tend to be on mondays because the 10 o'clock finish can strain to 11 o'clock if there's a finance bill that can go to any hour so you know, I have been voting in Parliament at two in the morning before. Um, and then Thursday is the earliest start. So Thursday is a 9.30 a.m. start and a 5 p.m. finish. Um, Thursdays tend to be one line whip days. So there tends to not be contentious business. Um, and a lot of MPs will often travel home Wednesday night, usually if they've got children, particularly um, myself, I had to travel Wednesday night after the last vote, which means I used to 
run to get on the uh, 820 train from Euston, um, uh, which I would often miss and I'd have to get on the 843, which is really annoying. Uh, or I would travel first thing Thursday morning to get back to Birmingham as soon as possible. Um, so, that, but obviously just because parliament sits at 2.30 or 11.30 doesn't mean to say your parliamentary day doesn't start till then. Um, Cause usually um, I, 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 when I first started I was kind of doing 9 a.m.s and then I thought, why am I killing myself? Because I'm still gonna be sitting at my desk at 11 o'clock at night and this is no way to live. So I've got really bullshit, but I don't do breakfast meetings. There's nothing that needs to happen over breakfast, frankly, uh, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> other than me actually <laughs> eating my breakfast. So I tend not to allow any meetings to creep in into my diary before nine o'clock um, in the morning. Uh, but then usually from nine onwards, I will do, uh, I don't know, briefings or meetings with stakeholders on, on, on whatever my business of the week is. Um, I try and keep Tuesdays and Wednesdays free uh, so that I can take part in part chamber. Um, so do various debates. It obviously depends on what the business of the house is that can, you know, sometimes I've had a full day of meetings with my constituents planned on, say, a Wednesday, and then there's a really important debate, and I've ended up not being able to do anything other than sit in the chamber and wait to be called. So you have to be quite nimble uh, with what you're doing during your parliamentary week. Um, and then the constituency bit of the week uh, for me is usually Thursday afternoons, Thursday evenings, and then all day Friday. And so I sort of stop at about Saturday lunchtime. Uh, it's quite rare for me to say yes to a Sunday thing. Um, I try and keep that as a sacred family day because my mother is scarier than any other person I know and her three line whips really mean something. So I try not to do anything on a Sunday. If I do, then I almost like claw that time back at a later part in the, in you know, in the, um, month. Um, Saturday mornings tend to be my advice surgery. Um, Friday evenings is my advice surgery as well. When I'm not doing an advice surgery, I might do campaigning on a Saturday morning. So sort of do Labour Party work. Um, Thursday evenings, I tend to do constituency meetings. It's quite rare for me to do a Wednesday night like this one, but obviously because of the new reality of Zoom <laughs> and the new timings, I've been able to do a few more uh, like this. Um, but yeah, so the two halves of the week have a very different feel and flavour to them. My Fridays are always like the best day of the week, but also a total nightmare because I literally am chock a block. So I always start with yeah. a team meeting with my my staff in my office. Um, I sign off various letters and things. That's always the first hour or so of the day, and then it's constituency visits, sort of ram in as many as I can, get to see as many people as I can, and then it's advice surgeries. Um, and my advice surgeries are very busy, so um, if they're so busy that we can't actually run. Um, a um, an appointment system because it would be overwhelmed and I'd have to give people appointments months in advance which would never work so it's first come first serve and we're like on it like lightning you know we, we rattle through as quickly as we can to see as many people as possible um, uh, obviously at the moment we're, we're not able to do that so we've been doing things over zoom and we're taking a lot of cases by email and on the phone uh, but usually I advise surgeries are the busiest bit of the week and they're always on a Friday and a Saturday so it's it's you know, I, I, I couldn't say that there are days that feel very samey. <laughs> um, since I've been an MP, we've, we've sat on a Saturday, which hadn't happened for a few decades when we did some of the Brexit votes. The last parliament mm -hmm. actually, 2017 to 2019, was a really weird parliament because obviously the government didn't have a stable majority at all. Um, and there, there were lots of very late night machinations <laughs> and all sorts of things happening <laughs> that required a very different kind of timing and, you know, adjustment. I mean, I, st I still feel like I'm recovering from those two years of politics because they were very different to the first sort of five or six years that I'd had, where at least you could get into a rhythm, whereas that parliament, there was no rhythm to be found anywhere. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my goodness. I I thought I was somewhat busy, but that's that's in, inspiring. I've never heard a weekly <laughs> schedule like that in my life. And <laughs> um, this, so apart from the obviously practical duties and the brilliant work you do during the during your MP career, and um, there's a brilliant question here from Zoe, um, and she asks, "Hi, Shabana, how did you gain confidence to embrace your own diversity in the workplace? I'm always keen to celebrate my own individual diversity, and um, but this can be nerve wracking to do when there's no one else in the room that shared my experience. And I assume that's especially so in the MP field as well, because again, it's not as diverse as we would like it to be in the workplaces. Um, so how, how do you gain the confidence to embrace diversity in the workplace? Um, so just in terms of my own personal experience, um, I think 
I sort of forced myself to think and believe until I actually did believe um, that I'm as good as anybody else who's there. And um, certainly when I was a lawyer, I mean, I had lots of knocks to my confidence as I was telling you all earlier, um, but you just have to regroup really because there's no other choice. <laughs> that's your, that's my career, that's my job. I've got to earn a living. And um, I kept telling myself, I am as good and you know, I've, I've got just as much to offer and um, sort of faking confidence until you actually start to feel it for real. Um, and there's been many, most of my life, I feel like I've faked confidence rather than actually felt it for real. <laughs> um, but it's a useful skill and it's usually something you just learn out of necessity because it's do or die. You know, you, you, like I'm either going to succeed as a lawyer or I'm not and I need to succeed and therefore I'm just going to force myself into this position of thinking more positively about myself and, and what I have to offer um, so so that's definitely something that that I've done a lot of and which has helped me um, and then as a politician there's a lot of that as well sort of faking confidence um, uh, I, I take a lot of comfort from the fact that basically most MPs when, when we talk privately they'll say often the same thing uh, men as well well as women but definitely all the women is very much a case of you know um uh faking confidence so we, we you know the the thing i didn't really um understand so well until i actually became a member of parliament is like i'd put my head above the parapet i'd sort of done that before i thought i, I i'd got the measure of what that was but um the scrutiny that comes with being a public face and understanding the difference between you the public face and then you the personal individual and politics is deeply personal so it's very hard to try and split the two things off but you know I'd never I, like, I don't really spend a lot of time looking at my face which when your face is plastered all over leaflets it's quite <laughs> <laughs> you know, I often thought, well, have I made the right life choice here? Because this is quite weird. And I don't really like it. I don't like watching myself back on the telly. You know, I'm not necessarily a fan of hearing my own voice back at myself either. So, um, you know, I, I very much just do those things and then I move on. <laughs> <laughs> and don't don't think about them so much um, again but it's very exposing and um also you know you're if you're holding out for universal popularity like this is not the job for you <laughs> uh, there will be people who who just take against you um you know i've had um leaving aside sort of straight up abusive emails or messages um uh, just 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 people who just really think that like i have nothing of use to say and are very vocal about making sure they've said it. Um, I remember every time I did an interview on Daily Politics with Andrew Neil, I, I'd never look at, I shouldn't look at your social media anyway, but I definitely wouldn't look at it then because there'd always be these sort of tweeters say, oh, Shimano Mahmood's crashed, car crashed again. And, you know, it can really knock you as well, but you have to sort of draw a distinction in your head and see that as part of the game that you're playing and not let it affect your confidence. But you de you definitely have to carve out a space for when you don't have your game face on, when you're not a public face. Um, that's why I'm so precious about my Sunday. Um, that's why, you know, when I'm at home, I'm very much at home. This is not, this is not a, a space for politics really. And I try, you know, I've separated out my work phone from my personal phone. I won't look at my work phone outside of my parliamentary hours or when I've switched off uh, when I'm back at home in Birmingham. So just finding ways to remember that that person who, you know, that is me too. And I'm being true to, you know, I'm saying what I think, I'm saying what I believe, I'm standing up for the people I represent. Um, but you need a bit of armor as well. So otherwise it's so exposing and the scrutiny you get for your, you know, your makeup, your clothes, all the things that I sort of thought, why would anybody care about that? But you know, when you're in the public eye, obviously those are all, that's all part of the parcel and part of the package of things you have to deal with. None of which I really expected to have to deal with. So I had to learn on the job. Um, but it, it comes with time, it comes with experience. And at the end of the day, I have a mandate. I have a responsibility to stand up for people. I have a responsibility to stand up for people who are not gonna be very popular with other members of the public on difficult issues where I've had a, you know, Twitter pile on or where the government said, oh, you know, Shaban and Mahmood speaking up for prisoners, like who cares about them? But, you know, if I represent their families, I have a responsibility. I can't just say, oh, bit difficult I won't be popular on Twitter I won't be popular with a particular section of the media so I'll just stay quiet over here and not give voice to these people they've elected me um, I don't have to agree with them on everything but if they're raising valid concerns and valid issues that speak to an issue of public policy I have a responsibility to raise it um, and that's 
that in the end that's what makes you speak up and find confidence more than anything else because that's your job that's your mandate absolutely thank you so much for that I think that's so interesting especially on having confidence in the responsibilities that you do have and actually have to I didn't even think about that really (laughs) when putting yourself forward you do have to represent people and the valid views of some and um bringing those views forward whether you completely agree with them or not I think that that that's brilliant thank you so much that kind of so we've got time for two more questions I think and they're quite quick ones but um there's a brilliant one here and it says hi Shabana do you have any tips on how to improve communication public speaking skills obviously you just mentioned the when when they are really brilliant issues you do have that confidence because you are their representative to bring those questions forward do you have any sort of final tips for anybody to improve those public speaking skills at practice practice is what does it in the end I I give the same advice to other MPs on media as well um I mean I don't look at my first few media appearances um but uh, this is the useful thing from um having trained as a barrister because I I don't know again if this is a thing that people still do but you know we would be filmed doing our applications or our mock trials and our cross-examinations and so on and then we'd have to watch it back as a whole group uh your individual performance which was so mortifying, um, you know, with your own cohort of students, but actually a very useful life skill. Firstly, you, you, you learn to filter out very quickly embarrassment and mortification at your own performance, and you learn to be quite clinical about the things you're good at and the things you need to be, you need to improve at. Um, and I always embrace that after I got over the initial horror of <laughs> watching myself back in a room full of my other, my, my friends and my fellow students. Uh, but having done that, actually, I find it easier to improve as a media performer because um, you know, I have what I force myself to watch back. I absolutely hate doing it, but uh, you watch yourself back and you're able to see, and it's it's really immediately obvious as well, like where where, where I needed to improve and where I needed what, what the things I was doing well. Um, but the best thing was just experience. I would I learned to say yes to more media opportunities, and then that generates more and more and more. And by by you know by the end of my sort of first phase as a shadow minister, um, you know I was considered one of the party's sort of more reliable media performers. But that's just because I've done a lot more, and and in the end that is the only way to do it. So it, it comes from practice and experience. Um, and you know and then after that I never felt nervous whether I was in front of Jeremy Paxman or Andrew Neil or Emily Maitlis or anybody you know all the top sort of interviewers of their day I've, I've done interviews with all of them now and actually had fun at most of them because once you've got a bit of experience under your belt confidence comes from that um, and in the end I was really quite enjoying myself so um, I, I would say <laughs> practice makes perfect and watching yourself back and being brutal with yourself and clinical and detached when you give yourself feedback or take feedback from others but do it constructively and always learn and build from it yeah that, that's something I definitely didn't think I would hear having fun on Andrew Neil interviews and oh he's TV. a total pussycat off uh, when the camera's not on he's he's a total pussycat he's, he's very easy <laughs> to deal with I got absolutely destroyed by him by the way the first couple I did I was like oh my god I never want to go on again um but then I watched them back and they weren't as bad when I was watching as when I was actually mm. doing them uh but then I learned the trick of handling him and I learned better to anticipate where our issues were going to be so uh, but in the end I was so good at it that they would the party would deliberately give me the hospital pass <laughs> of the day because <laughs> I was quite good at fielding the hospital pass so it's a very that's a very particular kind of skill but it's one that I um, ended up without meaning to developing so definitely definitely and then one one tiny quick question before yeah. we um jump off would you ever go back to a career in law <sighs> oh gosh oh that's a really good question um I mean, I, I, I don't think so, if I'm completely honest, because um, my legal career was now that I, I mean, obviously, I've been in this job now 10 and a bit years. I had my 10 year anniversary in May as an MP. Um, and I, th- I feel like I've sort of, I haven't forgotten law because obviously I deal with legislation every day, but I suspect I'm very, very out of touch and things have changed very, very significantly. So I, f- I, I, I figure I'd have to start all over again if I ever went back to the law, if I sort of, was done with politics and um, uh, was I, I'd have to start start right at the beginning again. Um, so I, I'm I'm not I'm not sure I would do that. I do miss the law. Uh, I definitely miss um, you know some days when you know things are 
stressful in this job uh, as they often can be and there's a lot to do I sometimes do think god there was this other life and this other career trajectory which would, which would have been a lot easier and <laughs> maybe I should have stayed at that um so I do I do miss it and I do sometimes wonder what my life would have been like if I hadn't jumped off and switched to politics instead um but but actually when all said and done you know this this job which is not really a job I guess in a traditional sense but this is absolutely a vocation and I I couldn't really imagine doing anything else and I'm determined I've only ever sat in the opposition as well so I happened to get elected at a point where Labour was on the downward trajectory as far as its electoral prospects were <laughs> concerned so I am determined to stick around and and see a Labour government if I can in my political career so I suspect that will be the natural time to then consolidate and work out what I do next but I'm determined if I can to serve in a Labour government so I, I'll be yes, around I'm... for as long as the people of Ladywood will have me. Yeah absolutely well that's a, a brilliant note to end on I um, personally hope that we also have one as well so thank you so much for um, on behalf of all Wilsock and everybody who's attended thank you so much for being our guest today it's been truly inspiring and uh, absolutely fascinating I had very little knowledge about MPs and how hard and long you actually work and it's been absolutely wonderful thank you so much for attending and sharing us your story and um, unconventional story as well and you aren't the majority and well one day I hope that there is no majority of anyone in any workplace and it's been brilliant to hear from you thank you so much thanks for having me thank you so much